following is a special video presentation from Orville Baptist Church. Good to see everyone here tonight. Always happy to see your faces. 
Um, be quick with announcements. You can look through your bulletin. I'll keep plugging it away. You got one more Sunday. So next Sunday, on the fourth, is our first annual Oracle Cookoff. Um, announced the, the rules, and this morning I'll, I'll say this one more time. Have you're doing a signature dish? You got your winner prepared already. You know you're going to win. Have your dirt, your dish ready to be served at six. We'll we'll have everything ready. We'll have everything already prepared. We'll show you exactly where to set and all of, all those good because we'll, we'll be prepared for, for all of that. Uh, to have it ready at six, and we'll go from there for a really really fun night. We'll have a good time of fellowship, and I'm certainly looking forward to it. I'll remind you, um, we've been doing a, a, a really really nice job replenishing our our pantry. Um, I think I say it every time, and I, I will continue to remind us to. Think about how we can serve our neighbors um, who, are, who are hungry and have needs. Um, as, as summer approaches quickly, it feels like summer to me already, we're running up out there. Um, think about items of your shopping and if you're getting stuff for yourself. Think about what other people that may have needs would also like. So, fruit cups are, are great. Anything that has a pop top, I always guarantee you can have a can opener. Um, you think with pop tops always going to be a better option. Think about things that you might enjoy um, during, during the summertime. We're getting to the point now where you want Gatorade and water, those kind of things are, are becoming a necessity. Uh, so be praying about how you can serve our, our neighbors and those around us and people in our community uh, by reaching out to them. And I tell you, it's, it's been a huge blessing. We've been doing it for a few months. Um, and it's been really, really special to see people uh, just be touched. And they're, they're so thankful, so appreciative. So I thank you as well. I appreciate everybody pitching in and the work that we've done. Um, that's been really nice. Go through um, this week and, and look at prayer list. Um, constantly adding, taking away, and giving praise for ways in which God is answering prayer. Um, and then we've got a full list. Plenty of opportunities for us to, to pray. And plenty of opportunities for, for us to pray. And then once we receive updates, go back to the Lord in, in prayer. Um, sometimes that's to, to pray for comfort. Sometimes that's to to pray for faithfulness for what he's done. In all things, we have to pray that the, the will of the Lord is done. For that, we are truly, truly thankful.
we all feel great conviction over our own personal sin. I also have, I would say, less, I mean, well, essentially they are lesser. less, but they're lesser convictions in the sense of things that we talk about in church and things that we address in church. One of the convictions that I share um, as church people, as a pastor, as doing things what we've always done is we take really two of the most pivotal moments in the scriptures. Two moments that everything, I mean literally, our entire faith hinges on. And we make them one time of year events. One of those events being Christmas. We tend to use December. The closest Sunday to Christmas, and we talk about the birth of Christ, and then the rest of the year, until next Christmas time, we don't mention much about that birth of our Savior, God in the flesh coming to us. We kind of just bypass that. I have a lot of conviction of that. I think that we should actually address that more often. The other one is Easter, the resurrection of that God in the flesh who came and was crucified, was placed in a tomb, and then after three days, the reason why we gather is not in vain because he lives. We don't, we don't do this enough. And so we just, I mean, it hasn't been that long ago that we celebrated Easter, but tonight I, I want us to, to address it again. And here soon we will, we will go through the quote unquote Christmas story. When we'll talk about the coming of our Lord and what that means for us and how important that is. I mean, it's the reason that we're here tonight. For that very reason alone, we must, we must preach on it more often. And so this will be somewhat different tonight because you're probably going to think we're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I ask that you would join me in the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 5. I will address some things from chapter 4. If you, you've got 4 and 5 and you open on both sides, you're going to be saving yourself a lot of trouble, a lot of turning. At least mine, I have 4 on the left and 5 on the right. It works out perfectly. And so, I'm a visual learner. I'm a visual person. I don't do well with just writing and reading and then kind of comprehending it, I can see it. I, I will certainly learn a, a whole lot more. And I can't help it. I do this in the New Testament as well, but there's something about reading from the Old Testament that just brings portraits to my mind. And so as we go through these, I'm constantly kind of visualizing what's going on here. Because there's this, there's this giant epic story being woven throughout all of the scriptures. And then in the Old Testament specifically, you get big, big scale pictures. You, have, you do have battles. You, you see large scale events happening between nations. It's, it, there's, there's just a, there's a sight to behold when you, you visualize it. So I, I want you to do that when we're going through events like this. So you can follow along with me if you would like. The first thing I want to read is from first chapter, first Samuel chapter 4. The first three verses kind of introduce a very significant um, moment, I should, I should say, in the scriptures. First Samuel 4, starting in verse 1. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle, camp beside Ebenezer, on the Philistines' camp in Achan. The Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated. On the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. Verse 3, when the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us take to ourselves from Shiloh the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. The ark of the covenant. Who, yeah, Indiana Jones fans? Anybody? It's in my top five. Um, Obviously, we don't have the ark. But in the first Indiana Jones movie, they're, they're chasing after the ark. And it surprisingly is a pretty good portrayal of what it was kind of described as. It's probably more rectangular in the movie. It's probably more squarish in real life. We make some measurements. 
But in a really good, it, it, it looks like it's described in, in the scriptures. And so we've always kind of wondered, you know, when we ever find it, when we see it, and then, then you, you have it mentioned here in 1 Samuel 4, if you want to see kind of the measurements of the total description, and we'll kind of go briefly over that. If you want to look at that, it's, it's found in Exodus 25, starting in verse 10. But just to, for the sake of time, it's, it would have been slightly rectangular, but it would have been probably more compact than we, than we actually think. It's, it, being close to a square, it was made of acacia wood, but it was covered inside and out with pure gold. Fine, fine gold. On the sides of the ark, you have these two rings. There would be two poles made out of that same acacia wood. Those poles would go through the rings, so you have somebody that was able to carry the poles, and then carry the ark. Inside of the ark, you would find what is called the tablets of testimony, aka Ten Commandment tablets. I'm not talking about iPads or this. Different, different kind of tablets that they have sold. And then you have on top what's called the, the mercy seat, which is essentially the, the cover of the ark. Go over it. On top of that, you see this being described in Exodus. There's, there's really two angelic beings. Their wings are kind of pointed to one another, and they would be sitting on, on top of that mercy seat. And so we've just read 1 Samuel 4. What you see in the Ark of the Covenant is incredibly important to Israel. We're going to see more, more of that as we, as we go on. And then we have the descriptions. Now we know kind of what we're talking about. Staying in verse uh, chapter 4, starting in verse 5, and pick up with me again. Look at verse 5. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Verse 8. Woe to us, who shall deliver us from the hand of, this, of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines. Or you will become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have been slaves to you. Therefore, be men and fight. They, even the Philistines, understood what the significance of the Ark of the Covenant meant. They understood. They got it. Verse 10. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent, and the slaughter was very great. For there fell of Israel, listen to this, thirty thousand foot soldiers. In the beginning of verse 11, and the ark of God was taken. Big, big, big loss for Israel. Everything that they, they knew and considered to be the presence of God that contained the, the Ten Commandments, the, had the mercy seat, that represented the very presence of, of Him being there with them. Now go. The ark has been captured by the Philistines. A heavy, heavy, heavy loss. As you continue running our uh, reading into this story, you'll see that there's a soldier that runs and he tells Eli about the outcome of the battle. A judge. This is what's happened. We've, we've been losing over and over. This, this man, Eli, is 98 years old and he's blind. And the soldier tells Eli that his two sons have been killed in battle. Sorry, Eli, but even your two sons have been slain with the army. Only after that does he mention that the ark has been captured. What's interesting is, and also sad, is when Eli receives this news, he, he falls backwards. He falls and he breaks his neck, and Eli ends up dying. Verse 18 says, as soon as he mentioned the ark of God, this is when it happened. The bad news, and it, trust me, it was bad news that his sons were killed, but ultimately that was not the overall bad news. The, the really bad news was the capture of the ark. That should give us a clue. You see? That should give us a clue to how serious their possession of the ark of the covenant was. Eli had just been informed that his two sons were, were killed in battle. And sure, when he heard that, he was obviously distraught. Uh, I mean, I can, I can only imagine but once he's told about the Ark of the Covenant being taken from him, that's when he falls backward in shock. 
That's when he falls over and ends up breaking his neck and, and actually is killed by it. That clues us in into what this symbolizes. The Ark of the Covenant is so important to Israel. Additionally, if you keep reading Eli's daughter-in-law, she was about to give birth. And she had also heard the news. It had been brought to her attention that the ark was captured and that her father-in-law or husband, they were all now dead. And now she has to go and give birth. And what does she end up naming the child Ichabod? Your translation may be a little different, but it kind of gives you a hint as to what that name means. And it means, where is the glory? In question, where is the glory? She had just been told that her father-in-law, and she had been told that her, her husband as well, as well as her father-in-law, they, 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 they're, they're gone. They're, they're gone. They're dead. But instead of those, that bad news alone kind of impacting her naming of the child, it was also the news of the ark is now out of our possession. And upon hearing that news, all she can ask is, where is the glory? Because now the ark that, that is our, our possession, that, that God is with us, it's now no longer with us. Where is the glory? The glory has been taken from us. It's no longer with us. It's no longer with Israel. This is a really, really big deal and a, a really, really heavy loss. At this point now is where I want us to be in the first Samuel 5, taking all of that into account. Follow along with me. Uh, the first five verses where, where I'd like for us to go. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to Ebenezer to Ashdod. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. This would be a statue, a false god. Their, their false god idol would be in this, this, this area. Verse 3, when the Ashdodites rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left in it. Verse 5. Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor all who entered Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. And so why are we saying all of this? What does this have to do with, with, with anything with Easter? Still may be asking. We'll get there, I promise. It all, it all comes together. The Philistines had had possession of the ark for, for several months at this point, at this point in the story. But it was only here specifically on this day in which they placed the Ark of the Covenant into the house of David, their God, their idol. And so you see the timeline here. Day one, the Ark is placed inside the house of the false god, their statue, their false god. Day two, the idol is found fallen over. Day three, the idol is found broken before the Ark. His, his head, his hands removed. There's only one true God. There's only one God. There is no room for false gods. There is no room for, for false idols. And when this group, these Philistines go to, to see Dagon, they see a false idol over submitting to the one true God. Long story short, they, they seek to move the ark to other places. God brings plagues to the Philistine, and basically what ends up happening is these groups <laughs> kind of kind of start training the ark. Because every time the ark goes to a to a new place or a new people or a new group, bad things, really bad things begin to happen. They, eventually, they're just like, "Here, you take it. I'm tired of plagues happening. I'm tired of things happening. You get this out of our. This is trouble. Get away from us." And everyone understood the significance of the ark. They knew why it was so valuable to have, but the problem is, it's not there. There's only one true God. And the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God in the Old Testament, is not to be mingled with other false gods. For he is God alone. So why was there trouble? Because none of these people were the ones that were called out by God. He belonged to a people. They belonged to him. Plague after plague 
plague after plague. I don't want this thing until finally they send the ark back to Israel. Along with the ark, they also send the guilt offering. Interesting. The guilt offering. And so what's all the, the point of 1 Samuel 5 and 1 Samuel 4? You mentioned Easter. How on how earth? I believe this story points us directly to Christ in that Jesus is the better Ark of the Covenant. He is the true better Ark of the Covenant. You look and you see how the Ark was, was, was used and was carried by Israel. When they were going to battle, when Israel would go to battle, the ark would be, remember on the fold, they'd be holding it? It would go before them. The ark was carried out first, and they would follow behind it. It was, it was sort of like, you see who we are, right? You know about what this means. It was a great symbol. This means that God is, is with us. Sadly, at one point, Israel, in one of their many wicked ways and one of the, the many different ways in which they failed. At one point, the ark became almost like a magic charm. Sad thing. When they would carry the ark, it was no longer in humility to who God was, but it was almost like holding a, what's the little rabbit's foot that people on a keychain? It was almost like that. It was no longer understanding this is the presence of God who is before us. And that's sad. But just as they would once take the ark before them, Jesus is the better true ark of the covenant because he commands his disciples and he commands his people. And he commands those who we have called to follow him. And the battle is over. He tells people, pick up your cross daily and you must follow me. And he goes to fishermen and says, follow me. And what happens? They get up and follow him. And he does the same to us and he's doing the same to the world today. The good news is the battle is already over. Israel will go and fight. We have no battle to fight. It's already been taken care of. And so when we follow Jesus, we don't follow him into war. We follow him into grace. We follow him into love. And we rest in the work that he's already done. I don't have to worry about battles when I follow Jesus, because I know for a fact I'm already secured and called. The same for you. Your fighting is over. Your fighting is done. It'll be hard days. You will have to kill your sin each and every day, just as I do. But as far as salvation is done, there is no more work left to do. We saw that inside of the ark, we, we see the Ten Commandments, and this is where we get the first case of, of the law. And so the Ark of the Covenant contained the law. It was Jesus who came and fulfilled it. Another step of understanding this work is already done. There's nothing I can do and nothing you can do to add on top of what Jesus has already done. You, I'm sorry, but you can't outwork Christ, and neither can I. The law has already been fulfilled. All of these requirements to earn perfect salvation, to be a perfect person, it's impossible. And so when Jesus comes to fulfill the law, that's even more of a reason why your battle does not exist anymore. Because you rest in His work. You rest in what He has done. Elsewhere in Scripture, you'll see the ark would, would also contain manna. This, this what is it type of bread? They would ask. What is this stuff? But it, it was a nourishment for Israel. And you also read in the New Testament, the Gospels, that Jesus is the living bread. The one that you eat of, and after that you, you do not die. If you go to the book of Numbers, you'll find out that Aaron's rod, which was placed inside of the ark as well, it would produce blossoms. It would produce almonds. It would spread off of that rod. And that the significance of that in the Old Testament was priesthood. It meant you were a part of the priesthood. When you go to the book of Hebrews, you see that Jesus was not a priest, he's the priest. He is the one true high priest, the one who would lay down his life and the one who would lift it back up again. He's the fulfillment of all of this found in the Ark of the Covenant. We already said that the Ark was constructed of wood, acacia wood, it was also constructed of gold. So you have a really common element, wood, and it was a very sturdy wood, by the way. And you also have this fine, elegant, precious metal called gold, and you see his nature in the Ark of the Covenant right there, the commonality 
of this basic man that God in the flesh, just like us. Remember who we said we said Jesus came as a nobody. He sure did. That's why we relate to him. Because we're a bunch of nobodies. We truly are. He came as a common man, and at the same time, he is God in the flesh. But that's the key. God. Wood and gold, but he's fully man, he's fully God. There's no separation of the two. There, he, Jesus is not some kind of cyborg. He's fully 100% God. He is fully 100% man. As you go through all these various stories of the Ark of the Covenant, it's, it's almost hard to fathom, but you'll see that many times, if you can read correctly, well, I say many times, <laughs> if you look in the Old Testament, it's every time. Every time the ark was handled incorrectly by not touching the poles of one of the poles, if you just simply touched it, what happened? It's dropped dead, right there. And so if you go and you touch the ark of the covenant, you die. But just like we said this morning, remember the, the woman in the crowd who she recognized who Jesus was. She, she saw this, this man. This 100% man is also 100% God. And as he's walking through the crowd, what does this woman who is hemorrhaging do? She reaches out. She touches his garment. She doesn't drop dead, she's healed. Jesus is the true and the better art that coming. He's coming, he's done all the work, the work that we could not do. And instead of touching and falling dead, there's touching and then there's life given. Yeah. Just through his garment. Just through this faith that she sees in looking, at, in looking at Christ and knowing he is the road, he is the gate, he is the path to salvation. Life is found in him. The instructions for the Ark of the Covenant was that God told Israel the poles of the Ark must never be removed. The access for man to always go to the Ark must stay there. For the ark to be moved, you have to hold it by the poles. You are never allowed to take those poles out because there must be constant access to that presence of God. Go to the book of Romans, specifically chapter 8, 38 and 39, verses we know all too well. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as those poles were never to be taken from the ark, but there was always access, there is absolutely nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There's nothing that can separate your relationship with Christ. Zero. There is absolutely there's nothing you can do, there's nothing you can say. He is with you always. He is yours. And you are His. Secondly, in talking about how this points to Christ, you look at Israel and you know for a fact they deserve to be captured. This is a battle, right? Think of how much happens, or think of what usually happens in the Old Testament especially, between two armies, even in secular history. Two armies come together, they have, a, they have a skirmish, they have a fight. This side loses. Does the victor usually say, all right, we've done enough damage for y'all, y'all just go home? What usually happens? You come with us. We're taking all your stuff. Your stuff is now ours. And guess what? Not just your stuff, you yourself. You are ours. You're coming with us. And so usually what would happen is the armies would go and be captive by the, by the victorious, our victorious army. What is it that is taken? What is it that is taken by the Philistine army? It's the ark. It's the ark that is the one that goes into the pit of death, into the house of David. It is the ark that is the one that is placed there. It is the ark that takes what should happen to Israel. It is placed there for three days. It's the ark, it's the presence of God that shows that all hope was lost. It's the ark that shows that there's nothing else we can do. We are hopeless. We're finished. Israel never tried to invade the Philistines, never tried to go and reclaim the ark. 
Israel didn't turn themselves in and say, hey, we're, we're not going to run from you. We just want our heart back. And if you don't give it to us, we'll fight again. None of that. The only thing that happened was that Dagon fell before the ark in complete submission. A statue, a false idol. Now it's over with its head removed, and its tall is removed. And so the idol was destroyed and conquered. On that third day, the ark is taken out of the conquered idol's house. That gives me goosebumps. And so you see in 1 Samuel 4 and 5, long, 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 long before the Messiah comes onto the scene, you see that there's this Easter story that when it seemed that the battle is, is over, when it seemed that all hope was lost, when it seemed that God himself had failed, when it seemed that God had took the punishment, God had entered into the valley of death for the sake of people, there was victory. There was victory in his death. And so the story of the Philistines, the story of the ark, it's a bold reminder, an incredibly bold reminder of the love and the mercy of God. And as it points to the coming sacrifice made by Christ, we, we often turn this type of looking at the, in the Old Testament as the scarlet thread of redemption. It's the scarlet thread that is woven from Genesis all the way to Revelation, in which you see Jesus from the very beginning all the way to the very end. You see this thread woven throughout the Old Testament. And then it all culminates with the death and the resurrection of our King. You see that story being told right here in 1 Samuel. And so without this resurrection, without the resurrection of Christ, again, I remind you, we're all idiots for showing up tonight. If it did not happen, we're, we're, we're total Mormons, total idiots. This is a waste of time. It makes no sense for us to gather if he has not been risen from the tomb. The good news is the Messiah is alive and well. And he's more than well, he's eternal. He's been glorified. He reigns for all eternity. This is why our lives, this very reason is why our lives cannot be centered around some kind of lackadaisical commitment to follow him. But the very opposite of that. We must understand that every breath we take, every second that we experience, every moment of our life, every moment that passes by, it must be filtered through that blood that was shed, that was shed on the God. Everything that we do is filtered through that portrait of what He has done for us. The dirty work is over. The hard work is over. The work that only God could do is over. The work that we had no business even trying to do because we would fail time and time again, that work is over. There's absolutely nothing we can or should fear because the, big, the biggest threat we could ever possibly face has already been defeated. Death is so fickle and frail and weak and conquered and defeated because of the work of Christ. There are no more chains on us. There is no fate in which we stop at a grave. And that's the end of the story. In fact, the punishment that we deserve, the punishment that I truly deserve, I said it last week, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, I deserve hell, and I know it. I know that for a fact. Because of what he has done, he has purchased every single one of us and redeemed us and called us out. Something only He can do. As I kind of opened at the beginning, may our lives be forever focused on the cross and on the empty tomb. Because without it, we have nothing. It's very true. Without those two things, we have absolutely nothing. But because we do have Him, we have everything. Everything. We'll close here, but I want to remind you and, and kind of encourage you to think about this. You're in life. Is it not a shame that we do this? Is it not a shame that we go 364 days without even thinking twice about what it means that God would, would come and walk with us? And I said, just, even just now, did you hear the way I said it? I said it so flippantly. That God would come walk with us. That defies all logic. 
It makes no sense. I've shared this illustration before, I think on Wednesday night. There's a book that I, I really enjoy um, by David Platt. He, he was he talked me about, I forget where he was at, he was somewhere overseas. They were all in the table and they were they were basically all universalists. They all believe, you know, if we do good and we try to please our version of God, we all be in the same place. And the way they they showed it to him is they said there's this big mountain. There's this big, big tall mountain. And we're all going up different paths, but eventually we all reach the top together. Eventually we all work our way up to God. They said, don't you agree with that? He said, absolutely not, because my God is the only one who was at the mountain and came down to me. Why do we not think on these things year round? It is absolutely ludicrous to even mean to the rest of the world that God has put on flesh and, and dwell among us. They would subject himself to this kind of flesh. It makes no sense to me, and yet that's exactly what he's done. That's unreal. So I say all this to encourage you, to encourage myself, year round, may we focus on the cross, may we focus on the empty tomb, because it is, it is the reason we live, it is the reason we breathe, it is the reason we gather, it is the reason we worship. Do not let the Lord reflect on these things. Reflect on the crown of thorns, on the nails, on the cross, on the tomb, on the empty tomb, and the rain that we one day share with you for all people.